Hello, everybody, and welcome to the New York Public Library. My name is Martha Hodes. I'm interim director of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the library, stepping in for director Salvatore Stibono, who's on fellowship leave for the next two years. This evening, we continue our wonderful fall lineup for conversations from the Coleman Center, a collaboration with Live from NYPL. Coleman Center fellow and historian Mei Nai will discuss her new book, The Chinese Question, The Gold Rushes and Global Politics, in conversation with the distinguished historian Eric Foner. You may know that the Coleman Center selects 15 fellows each year for a nine month term. The program was founded in 1999 and to date we've supported the work of more than 300 fellows. Fellows receive an office in the center and a living stipend so they can focus exclusively on their work. They come to the library to gain intensive access to our unparalleled collections in order to write the books of tomorrow. Our fellows are among the best and most promising academics and independent scholars, fiction writers and poets, journalists, translators, playwrights, dramatists and artists at work today. Writers and scholars from any country are welcome to apply, and the application for the next round will be available in June on our website. Our next talk by a Coleman Center fellow with live from NYPL will feature Faith Hillis in conversation with Mike Duncan. If you'd like to register for that or any of the other fantastic events at live from NYPL, go to nypl.org live. You can also see all of our events and everything else the library has to offer by signing up for our newsletter at nypl.org slash connect. All these programs are made possible through the generosity of patrons like you, so please consider supporting the library however you can. If you have an NYPL library card or live in New York State and want to apply for one now, you can borrow the Chinese question for free or you can buy the book from the library shop. Proceeds benefit the library. You can find links to buy the book in the chat or on the event page found at nypl.org slash live. Mainai has also offered some further reading, which you can find along with ways to access these titles from the library on the event page, again, nypl.org slash live. Before I invite our guests to the screen, just a couple of important points. First, real-time captions are available for tonight's program. You can click on the closed caption button or use the stream text link shared in the reminder email and chat for a live transcript. Second, this event is being recorded. The library values your privacy, so in the spirit of transparency, there are a few things we want you to know. Even though the video and chat are on an nypl.org page, they're hosted by YouTube. By participating in the chat, you might share data about yourself, which the library doesn't control. For more details, you can visit our Frequently Asked Questions page, along with Google's privacy policy and the library's privacy policy, all available on the event page. Okay. Our guests this evening will converse for perhaps 40 minutes. After that, we'll open the floor to your questions. You can send your questions anytime using the chat or Google form or by emailing publicprograms at nypl.org. Now to our speakers. Mainai's interlocutor this evening is the mighty Eric Foner, the DeWitt Clinton Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University. Eric is the author of a great many acclaimed books, so I'll name only the most recent. The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln and American Slavery, Gateway to Freedom, the Hidden History of the Underground Railroad, and The Second Founding, How the Civil War and Reconstruction Remade the Constitution. And this last is one of the titles on May's further reading list. Eric's books have been called monumental, brilliant, and emotionally resonant. He's won the Pulitzer Prize in History for the Fiery Trial, and he's won numerous other awards, ranging from the Presidential Award for Outstanding Teaching from Columbia University, to the Everyday Hero of Freedom Award from the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. You may have read Eric's writings at any number of major newspapers or perhaps seen him on screen, whether in a PBS documentary or on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Eric speaks tonight with May Nye, 
the Lung Family Professor of Asian American Studies and Professor of History at Columbia University, where she also co-directs the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race. May is the author of two previous terrific and important books, The Lucky Ones, One Family and the Extraordinary Invention of Chinese America, and Impossible Subjects, Illegal Aliens and the Making of Modern America, which won six book awards. You may also have read May's writing in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and the Atlantic, among other venues. May is the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, Harvard, Princeton, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, among many others. Most important, May was a Coleman Center Fellow in 2012-13, where she worked on the Chinese question. An investigation of Chinese emigration and immigration, the book's research ultimately took May to five continents. It's also a history of the Chinese diaspora and global capitalism, of discrimination and resistance. The Wall Street Journal has already called the Chinese question a work of towering ambition. We're so happy to welcome Eric Foner and May Nye. Okay, um, thank you, Mark. All right, are we uh, going here? It's uh, very, it, it's an honor to be uh, engaging in conversation here with May Nye about her superb new book, The Chinese question. I do want to say at the beginning that um, one thing Martha Hodes didn't mention is that I was the uh, chairman of her doctoral dissertation uh, committee back in the day at Columbia University. Although, of course, I learned a lot more from her than she did, I'm sure, uh, from me. But anyway, this uh, event now gives me a chance to ask her a few questions that I forgot to mention on her orals exam. <laughs> The Chinese Question is a compelling book. It is very well written. It's highly original. Uh, it deals with big questions, racism as an international phenomenon. It ranges between uh, several countries. It's international in a sense in its, in its approach to the Chinese question, but it does not fall into the trap that sometimes um, transnational histories fall into of homogenizing all of history. It makes it clear how uh, anti-Chinese sentiment developed in specific historical contexts and, uh, and was um, uh, different in some ways in these different contexts. We'll get into that in this discussion. It also emphasizes that Chinese immigrants, whether in the United States, in Australia, in South Africa, were not simply victims, although they certainly faced uh, very difficult circumstances in many cases, but were historical actors who resisted uh, efforts to um, deny them basic rights. Um, so um, one can't just see the Chinese in America or in other places, as I say, as recipients of the uh, activities, the actions of, of their white uh, co um, compatriots. Um, and the book reminds us of something that uh, maybe many people who know about American history are not totally aware of, which is simply the depth of anti-Chinese prejudice in the 19th century in the United States and in other countries. Uh, it may be considered a positive thing that um, it should be that uh, that kind of prejudice against Chinese people no longer exists in this country. Uh, not that uh, there's not a lot of uh, xenophobia nowadays, um, but um, this, you know, this was a very a deeply held view by many people in the 19th century. But I want to begin by asking May, I guess, the most uh, common question when dealing with a book, which is how did you get interested in this particular aspect of the subject, the role of Chinese in particularly in the gold rushes in different countries? and how that became an incubator for anti-Chinese sentiment. What, what, made, what drew you to the specific subject of the gold rush in the United States or in Australia, et cetera, as a way of getting into the Chinese question? Thank you, Eric. Um, 
And thanks to Martha and the Coleman Center, I just want to say that um, I was really honored to be a fellow at the center. Uh, it seems like a long time ago now, 2012. Um, and it's where I did some of the first writing on this book. So I, I'm very appreciative and honored to have this occasion to talk with um, Eric, my former teacher, from whom I learned a lot. Um, OK, so um, how I got interested, you know, when you write a book, you often don't start out with what you end up with. You know, you start out with something, a question or something small. and, and and I started out because I wanted to clarify that Chinese in 19th century California were not indentured, because this was the common view uh, in much of the literature, that they were coolies, which was a shorthand for semi-slavery or indentureship. And it's not just that they were held in bondage, but that it was the basis for a whole raft of negative stereotypes, that they were docile, that they were easily exploited, that they could live on one bowl of rice for a week, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I wanted to um, slay the coolie myth, so to speak. And I found that this idea was ubiquitous in the scholarship so that I had students writing papers who cited, you know, uh, respectable historians, uh, you know, saying this stuff. And I said, but that's not true. And they would say, well, but look at, look at all these footnotes. And I had to say, well, yeah, because people haven't really done the research. So I set out with a goal to slay the Cooley myth. And I decided that from the beginning, I had to tackle it as both an empirical question. There had been so much misunderstanding about what the Chinese actually did. Um, and as a political question, as a question of the racial discourse. So the Cooley myth, as you say, is, is an important part of the book in the sense that it's one of the mobilizing devices for anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, one of the things that's uh, kind of interesting and, I don't know, I guess ironic, is how anti-slavery sentiment could be utilized by anti-Chinese uh, activists or <laughs> prejudiced people trying to, in other words, uh, the Chinese, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the Chinese immigrants were seen as a kind of uh, remnant of slavery, which supposedly had been abolished, it had been abolished in the United States and in the British Empire in the 19th century. Um, so you, have, you seem to find a very progressive set of ideas about free labor, about the importance of workers, you know, having some kind of autonomy and yet turned into a, a, uh, an argument for uh, excluding Chinese from various places. Now, this is widely, I mean, this, this is obvious in the United States. What about in other countries that, that you studied? Is this not the connection of anti-Chinese sentiment with anti-slavery thought um, present in the other places you studied, uh, Australia, South Africa, or is that something that's more specific to the United States? That's a great question because what I found in my research is that this idea that Chinese were like slaves is something that starts in the United States. It is not the principal complaint about Chinese in Australia, but the politics travel and then it becomes adopted in other places in the Anglophone world. In the United States, actually the idea that Chinese were like slaves starts before the Civil War because Chinese first came around 1850. So to say they were coolies was a kind of racial shorthand to compare them to slaves and the threat of slavery. So it wasn't so much an anti-slavery uh, view, it was that they were threatening like slaves were. And I think we have to remember in the West, even though they were threatening, right? Because they, and in the West, you know, anti-slavery was, was not an anti-racism, right? There were, there were right. Western states that, you know, uh, excluded uh, free Blacks even. So anti-slavery, especially in the antebellum years, had, had a racist connotation to it among, among some of the proponents. Now, in, um, so it, it was a very, it was a quick way to associate Chinese with the threat of Blacks, right? And of course, yeah. the, the argument was also so the argument was also that their presence was somehow reducing white labor to a slave-like condition. Right, but that's what people also said about blacks, right? Mm -hmm. 
that slavery would lower, that if you freed blacks, it would lower the condition of whites. Mm -hmm. But comparing Chinese to blacks doesn't get you very far in Australia because Australia doesn't have African slavery. The history of unfreedom in Australia is convict transportation of poor what? Irish and poor, poor English. That, that, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm, I don't want to interrupt you. Right, so you don't, you, there, you don't get any mileage from saying they're like slaves because it, it, doesn't, it doesn't connect to people in Australia. What did resonate in Australia was this idea that Australia was at the far reaches of the British Empire and its closeness to China was what upset people because there were only, there were fewer than half a million people in Australia in the middle of the 19th century. And so at China as being, you know, that they would send millions and millions of people and overwhelm Australia. So it was more a question of proximity and being overrun that generated anxieties in Australia. That, yeah, that's an interesting point. One of the more striking sentences in your book, I can't remember exactly what chapter was, where you talk about comparing Chinese immigrants to slaves, you know, but you say, well, the answer given was not to free them, exactly. but to get rid of them, in other words, so that the anti-slavery argument could be used as a way of condemning exploitation of Chinese workers, but that's not how it worked out. But this, your mention of Australia now uh, leads me to another question, which was, um, how did the, the nature of the indigenous population affect attitude toward Chinese. In other words, we're talking about three, uh, you know, three places. One, the U.S., where in particularly the West Coast, California, um, where there's a very large Native American population in the 1850s, although it very rapidly declines, as you know. Um, South Africa, obviously a very large Black African population there. And then Australia, much lower population, indigenous apparently. How, it, but how did the nature and the size of the indigenous population, you think, affect policies and attitudes toward Chinese immigrants? Well, in California, I think the native very back in the 1850s. So by the time Chinese came in large numbers, there weren't that many left. And I think there, there were some still. And Chinese um, engaged with them, I think, you know, not too unlike other, other minors of other nationalities. You know, sometimes they traded with them, but other times they, um, th there was violence right between them. Um, so they didn't have particularly good relations because the Chinese were like the other minors who were interlopers, right? They were all. Right. Um... It, uh, um, really did, it, go ahead. You're going to ask me something else? Yeah, no, I was I was just trying to think think this through a little bit. I mean, that actually raises a bigger question, which is a real challenge. I mean, one of the impressive things about this book is just the way you navigate between these different places. Uh, it's hard enough to write a book about one country, <laughs> to write about three places at the same time and show the specifics, but also the commonalities uh, is... Um, is a very fine achievement. So uh, that's one of the, you know, very good qualities of the book. But I'm, I'm kind of interested in the challenges of doing this kind of transnational history. Obviously, just research itself, uh, you've got to go all over the place. I mean, maybe that's fun, maybe not. But uh, <laughs> you, you don't have one archive which um, enables you to do all, all of your research. Um, but I'm more interesting to me, actually, is how you master different historiographies. <laughs> In other words, you know, there's a large number of people who have written about Australia. There's a large number of people who have written about South Africa. Uh, you know the U.S. literature. You started out knowing the U.S. literature very in great detail, but presumably weren't quite as familiar with what was written. How do you sort of deal with the questions that are being asked by historians in other places that reflect the, you know, preoccupations of those countries rather right. than what we're familiar with. Right. Well, it was a big challenge, um, and uh, I read a lot 
I sometimes I talked about it as though I were reading for another oral field. <laughs> you know, I had to master or not even master. I just had to become familiar with the historiography in different places, not only Australia and South Africa, but the British Empire, you know, and, and Brit British politics, which mm -hmm. comes into the book as well. So I, I had to do a lot of reading, but I also had help from colleagues that I met at conferences or workshops uh, in Australia or South Africa or in Great Britain. And so I workshopped chapters um, and was saved from many embarrassing mistakes in my thinking uh, from generous uh, historians friends and colleagues. Um, and I had, um, I also sent chapters to people who generously read them and corrected more mistakes. So I hope in the end that I didn't make too many mistakes, but, um, but it's a big challenge. And you know, like when I was in grad school, Eric, you remember this, I mean, we were all told don't do a comparative study, don't do two places, because it's like writing two dissertations. Well, now everybody has to up their game because everybody wants to do transnational work. So it's a huge challenge. Um, I don't recommend it at the graduate level. Although we have and you know, every the stakes are higher and higher. So it, it's a lot of work. Yeah, I I think it's easier said than done doing transnational <laughs> history, you know, and um, my 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 suspicion is that it may be uh, the focus on it may be diminishing a little bit because of the difficulty of doing that kind of work and putting us even just the language, uh, the language requirements, you know, um, uh, if you're actually going to seriously do research in a number of different countries. But of course, there are people, you're number one, but there are others like our former student, uh, Sven Beckert and others who have managed to do excellent work. And the, you know, part of the value of it is to, to my mind, actually, is to question what the inherited notion here of um, American exceptionalism. Right. You know, much of it, every country has its own different history, but much of what we think of about as American exceptionalism is often based as just not knowing anything about other places. So we think the United States is unique in ways that maybe it isn't. Uh, his, historically speaking. Um, but that's not your question. That's not your problem, whether there's American exceptionalism <laughs> or not. Um, uh, but, um, you know, by the way, it, May just mentioned that she also touches on British politics, internal British politics, which is very interesting. It, the, 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 the election in Great Britain of 1906 Yes. Which brought the Liberal Party and Lloyd George, right, to power and launched, you know, a tremendous period of political conflict in England over the people's budget and uh, breaking the power of the House of Lords. I mean, that that election is well known to people who know anything about British history. But what they don't tend to know is that the status of the Chinese in the colonial in, in the British Empire played an important role in that election, how, how, how was that? How, why were they debating the Chinese well, in England during that election? It's really funny because the political histories of Britain that talk about the 1906 election, they all talk, mention the Chinese question. They say, oh, the Chinese question was huge. And it went away, they all mention it and then they dismiss it because they can't explain it. And so it becomes a, a big question, uh, particularly because in South Africa at the time, there was the, which was an indentured labor program of um, close to 60,000 Chinese who were, uh, went to the, the RAND to work in the deep gold mines. And there were charges that they were treated like slaves. So the Liberal Party, you know, brings out the bloody shirt, right? Brings out the history of British abolitionism and says, and the Labour Party also, well, this is before Labour is a party, right? Labour is uh, a kind of committee that's connected to the Liberals. And right. the Chinese question actually helps propel the Labour labor to become its own party. And so for Labour, what I believe is that in addition to the rhetorical uh, benefit of abolitionist, the abolitionist position, is that British working men actually saw the settler colonies as their 
migration from Britain is actually at a very high point. Most people are going to South Africa, and they, of course, they still go to Australia. And so they see uh, the Chinese in Australia, I mean, in South Africa, as, uh, as a barrier to labor emigration from Great Britain. And so uh, there's a sociologist named Jonathan Heislop who calls it the, the emergence of the imperial white working class. And this is the idea that um, Brit the British uh, workers have first claim to all the sets. So this is where the irony comes up where they talk about slavery, but they don't talk about freeing them. They talk about excluding them, right? So it becomes a very useful vehicle in the context of the election. Um, but of course, a lot of it is um, it's unsaid. They're not saying we want to go to South Africa, although some people say it. Um, what what labor is really interested at this time is social welfare benefits. But emigration, you could say, is another kind of status reform, right, to help the working class. Right. Well, that's, uh, as, as I say, that's developed in a very interesting manner in the book. Uh, and it was uh, news to me. I'm one of those who knew all about the election of 1906, I thought, but I obviously hadn't. Um, now, in the, the politics of Chinese exclusion, of anti-Chinese racism, you uh, one of the characters in your book is Governor Bigler of, uh, of California. Uh, you sort of credit him, so to speak, with uh, developing anti-Chinese sentiment as a political weapon. Um, and uh, what was, what do we know, you know, why, how did Bigler mobilize this in order to help, you know, the Democratic Party basically in, uh, in California in the early 1850s? Was this pure cynicism, just saying, well, you know, uh, this is a good way to get votes by playing on uh, prejudice? Or um, did he have any experience of dealing with Chinese people before he was governor? Well, what do we know about Bigler and his anti-Chinese campaign? No, I think it was entirely cynical. Bigler was the first governor uh, of California. I mean, after he became a state, he was elected in 1880. Um, and he, he comes from uh, Pennsylvania. So he was um, uh, a kind of Northern Democrat, right? So, um, and, uh, and, and so he, um, when he faces reelection uh, in 1852, uh, it's a very tight race. And so he, he's looking for a campaign issue to bring uh, more people to his side. Um, there'd been a lot of corruption in his administration. It was not clear that he was going to be reelected. And this is a time in 1852 when in the gold districts, the, uh, the easy pickings have already been taken out, right? So the, the placer mines and the streams are, are being exhausted and the miners are restless. So he uses the Chinese question um, uh, as a way to arouse the mining districts. And he wins the election by um, less than a thousand votes. Um, and his, his speeches that, that appeal to uh, the white miners, um, they get, it gets picked up. They, he actually has leaflets printed and he has them distributed all throughout the interior. And miners, white miners begin to hold meetings and pass resolutions to keep out the Chinese using the same rhetoric that they're coolies. You know, so he, he creates in, in this context of a political election and it becomes what I believe is the nativist playbook you, you, you seize upon a grievance that people have, you blame a group for causing it with a false theory, and then you weaponize it for a political gain. That's the nativist playbook. You see it over and over again, and, and Bigler introduced it into California right. politics. Now, you also mentioned in talking about California politics, there are these um, uh, Cooley bills that were introduced in the California legislature, which were, as I understand it, to trying to actually enforce labor contracts that had been signed overseas, uh, but that this, did, these did not pass. Uh, what was the point of these Cooley bills in the legislature? So in the, um, in the late 18, you know, after the gold rush gets under. 1849, everybody in California is talking about how to develop California, right? So there's a lot of schemes about 
um, not just what gold mining is going to bring, but agriculture in particular and trade with Asia. So there are grand ideas and, and boosterism about developing California and the Pacific coast, right? There's, there's some people who talk about California re reaching from Alaska to Chile, right? That they're gonna conquer the Pacific. And so Chinese labor becomes thrown into the mix as to something that can help develop California. And the views on Chinese labor considered Chinese immigrants or, or they do not promote um, indentured Chinese immigrants. They just want Chinese to come as workers. And there are others like these um, two uh, figures in the legislature who introduced these coolie bills who want to bring Chinese under contracts. And they actually don't want Chinese for contracts in mining. They want it for agriculture, right? And they have, they have a vision that's like uh, the Hawaii plantations or even the, the Cuban plantations, right? They want Chinese coolies. Um, and so, uh, Point of the, the point of the bill was that if a contract is made in a foreign country, i.e. China, it is enforceable in the United States. That was the language of the bill. Um, so it was a kind of, it was a way to uh, legalize indentured, indentured um, immigration. Right. The, but they failed, they failed. Yeah, the, um, there already had been a whole lot of laborers from Asia, more from India, right, brought to the, at least to the Western Hemisphere, to the Caribbean, to Peru. Right. Uh, after the end of slavery in the British Empire, some of the planters brought in indentured Indian labor in order to take the place of slaves or former slaves who didn't want to work as slaves anymore. So there was a sort of um, tradition. Model, right, that was their model. There was a model set up already of, of right, exactly. large scale indentured labor. But this, you know, this raises the question you point out that initially there were quite a few people in California who actually welcomed Chinese labor, uh, partly because there's a kind of a labor shortage. But um, at, at what point do you think the anti Chinese sentiment kind of overwhelmed the business sentiment that, well, we need labor and we ought to start, we ought to encourage Chinese? Well, there are always people who welcome Chinese labor, um, okay. even at, even when, I mean, the thing I think that we need to understand is that not every white person in California hated Chinese people. Right. It was a political movement. It's like, you know, you think about Trump and the white supremacists, right? They don't represent all Americans, right? But they dominate the news, right? They, they dominate certain uh, counties or, or whatever. So there are always people who, um, were not hostile, at least towards Chinese. And there were businessmen, uh, agriculturalists, um, uh, factory owners in San Francisco who did welcome Chinese labor. There were also, there was a, there was a famous incident. Than white labor. Yeah. There was a famous incident, not in California, but in uh, Massachusetts in this era where a group of Chinese were brought in as strike breakers that's in the 1870s, I think. That's in the 1870s, right? That's later in the 1870s. Right? Yeah, was that a pattern that was used by business either in California or elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, we only know of two instances, the one in Massachusetts and one in a laundry in Newark, New Jersey. We don't, we don't know of other instances of strike. Okay, okay. Strike breaking. Um, uh, you know, in California, the Chinese... Um, they drained and, and reclaimed the Delta and made it, um, you know, uh, possible for large scale farming. They also um, worked in uh, cigar factories and rope factories. You know, they worked in a lot of um, manufacturing shoe, shoe factories. This became a point of contention in the 1870s with white workers in San Francisco who right. believed Chinese were uh, taking jobs. That's actually a more complicated story and actually Alexander Saxton wrote about this in 1975 and he showed that um, there actually were not that many Chinese in jobs that had been from whites but it was in certain sectors where white craftsmen were pushed out the guilds were threatened by not by Chinese labor per se but by imports from the east coast right mass manufactured goods came with the railroad. The railroad did not bring unalloyed prosperity to the West. It brought cheap goods. It brought more people, which depressed wages. Um, so again, the Chinese, I think, become a scapegoat 
for the precarity faced by uh, working people in California after the completion of the railroad. You know, speaking of the 1870s, that period, um, I was just because of my own uh, scholarly interest, I was very interested in the role of the Chinese issue in Reconstruction in the period right after the uh, right after the uh, Civil War. Um, I, I, I'm kind of wondering about it because um, at this, there's at least a, a group of, as you said, not every white person hates Chinese, said that there's a there's a group, there's a, one impulse is to actually extend a kind of egalitarian opening for people from China. Uh, of course, Frederick Douglass's famous composite nation speech, a remarkable speech, directly addresses the question of China. He doesn't just say, well, welcome immigrants in a vague way. He directly uh, right. addresses the question of the Chinese. Do we allow them here? Should they vote, et cetera? And he says, yes, absolutely. They're as much entitled to come as anyone else. And when they are here, they have the same claim to equal rights as anybody else. Reconstruction is a time when this notion of equality is being you know, pushed very, very vigorously and written into the Constitution uh, and the laws. Um, and you have this, um, you, you reprint this um, cartoon by Thomas Nast uh, with, uh, about commenting on discrimination against the Chinese with a, you know, the motto, fair play for all men. Uh, that's, you know, that it's not that remarkable, given that that's a basic slogan for Reconstruction. Uh, but um, what, I, what I was, what I'm wondering about is how much of a role do you think the question, the Chinese question, as you call it, um, play in Reconstruction politics? in this whole question, or is it a limit to egalitarianism that shows the, you know, uh, the sort of darker underbelly of what's going on? I think that the Chinese question is tied to um, the sectional politics that emerged during Reconstruction. Um, so people outside of the West Coast, they don't really know that much about Chinese. Um, so there's not a lot of attention paid to it. Although with one, one thing that's interesting is that Anson Burlingame, who was uh, Lincoln appointed as ambassador to China in 1861, uh, Burlingame was a, a free, an abolitionist who, came from, who originally came from Massachusetts. And when he was in China, he hung out with the other uh, Western diplomats and he thought they were horrible. He thought they were arrogant and they want to take China by the throat, he said, and he wanted a, a more friendly relationship with China. So the Qing government actually appoints Burlingame to be their emissary to the United States and he leads the delegation and he negotiates uh, with Seward a treaty. It's called the Burlingame Treaty, but it's actually represents China in this treaty. And it's not an altogether equal treaty. You know, there's still aspects of inequality in it, but it's much more friendly to China and it includes the right of immigration. So the exclusionists have to overturn that treaty in order to enact the exclusion laws. And, you know, the whole run up to the passage of exclusion is interesting because when you actually read the, the congressional record, you hear voices from the Midwest and from the North that say, wait a minute, they're not slaves, are they really? You know, why should we keep them out? I mean, there is a voice still in 1880, 1881, 82, there's still voices. Uh, that's, a, that's a very good point. They're not quite willing to go along with it. Yes, and not only that, why does exclusion pass Congress in 1882? It's because there's an alliance between the South and the West. That is, that is the vision that Douglas spoke against, right? That is the alliance of white supremacy from the West and the South. And that sectional alliance is what brought about Chinese exclusion. And, you right. know, it wasn't like if it didn't pass Congress 100%, there, there were differences. And I think that, you know, we, I mean, there is if you, not I, counting California, the red states is the South and the West, right? So right. that's the legacy of this of this politics. 
and that's a, that's a very good point because I've, I've often been struck by the fact that, as, as we know, in the late 19th century, the 1880s and 90s, the Supreme Court was whittling away at the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment, interpreting them in the narrowest possible way. And for black people, those amendments were losing, you know, whatever power they had had during the height of Reconstruction. And yet when it came to Chinese, there was a series of decisions that did, that tried to absorb Chinese uh, people into uh, the notion of birthright citizenship, even though, as you well know, of course, Chinese immigrants could not become naturalized citizens. The Supreme Court said, but their children born in the United States are citizens. A lot of people objected to that. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering why and, and then they also use the equal protection of the law of the 14th Amendment to strike down anti-Chinese legislation from the states or cities. Um, I'm kind of wondering why this, and I don't think there's an easy answer to this, so maybe there's no answer at all, really. Well, but I have an answer. Why, I have why an at answer. the time, all right, good. At the time that they're taking away the rights of blacks, the Supreme Court is sort of underpinning certain rights for Chinese. Right. So I, I, I have an answer. Maybe it's not okay, good. the correct answer, but my answer is that um, when Wong Kim Ark finally gets before the Supreme Court in 1898, there's already been 20 plus years of agitation that Chinese are not citizens. They call them pseudo citizens, fake citizens. Chinese born in the United States cannot be citizens. And so there's, uh, legally speaking, there's a lot of muddy muddiness in the situation. And the court, if you read Wong Kim Ark, they say, well, the language of the 14th Amendment is plain. It is plain. And if we deny Chinese birthright citizenship, we place in jeopardy the citizenship of all the children of European immigrants. So the, I believe that's why they did it. You know, they had no love for Chinese, but they, they, I think they, at least they had some principles at that, at that point. <laughs> The other I think, point, right. I, I think that's exactly the answer. Yeah. yeah. That, and the other point, like if you look at Yik Wo in 1886, um, which was a really important case because it's actually it's, it's a case that almost incidentally says that, you know, underscores that the 14th Amendment applies to all people, not just citizens. But in upholding economic rights, I think uh, the court had a bigger agenda there. Um, you know, Justice Field in particular had been agitating for um, extending the 14th Amendment to economic rights, which was going away from the political rights of Black people, right? But in pushing it towards economic rights, um, the Chinese provided the useful case for, for that move. We only have a few minutes before we go to questions. So I want to jump a century or so uh, closer to the present. Um, American Chinese relations right now are in a kind of fraught state. We seem to be entering a kind of a new Cold War frame of mind in terms of relations with, with China. Uh, there's been an increase in violence, just random violence on streets, etc., against people perceived as being uh, Asian, Asian American. Um, I'm wondering. Uh, what you have given you the longer sweep of history, and um, how do you see the implications of the current relations between the United States and China affecting people of Chinese descent in the United States here? Well, it, it's it's not good news for us. Um, it's not the main reason to to take a position on U.S.-China relations, but we certainly. Uh, I think we suffer collateral damage from bad relations between the United States and China. Um, it's all about uh, economic competition. Both sides have extremely um, nationalistic um, support in that. In that, I don't think I don't I don't think U.S.-China relations has to be based on competition. It's not a zero sum game. Although, unfortunately, that's seems to be the point of view of both sides. So that's really unfortunate. Um, and Chinese and other Asian Americans in the United States are, you know, bystander victims to this, uh, this problem. But it, but it draws on this very long history of anti-Chinese racism where people consider uh, Asian Americans or Chinese Americans to be just like a, 
um, an emissary of China, right? So if you're mad at China, you can attack an Asian person on, on, in New York City. And that makes sense to people who, who draw upon you know, the, this deep well of right. racism. Right. Although, uh, as you well know, of course, in the 1960s, 70s, more recently, uh, the, an alternative view of Chinese Americans became prominent, the so-called model minority idea that look at here, Chinese are hardworking and educationally oriented and uh, successful economically. In a sense, that was used uh, by some people to kind of browbeat blacks for not getting ahead better, you know, against discrimination. Um, but I think uh, we're going to go in a minute right now to questions. But I think one thing the book certainly shows us is that um, is the dire, you know, effects of this kind of prejudice on people. But also, and unfortunately, we haven't really gotten into it, the fact that Chinese uh, immigrants did mobilize against the violence. Right, right. at every turn. Them. Right, at and, every turn. Yeah, they mobilized and... Um, and opposed, uh, you know, these laws that were discriminatory, et cetera, et cetera. So they weren't just inert victims of, um, of prejudice. But it is 745 now, and I want to leave some time here for questions. So we're going to give the floor over to Lauren, I think, who will pass questions to us here. Yes. Hello uh, to those watching from home. I'm Deputy Director of the Coleman Center, and I'll be passing on questions from the audience. So feel free to keep sending them in. Um, our first question is, can you explain the phrase, the gold rushes in the plural in the title of your book? Well, my book talks about the gold rushes in North America, uh, mostly California, and in Australia, mostly in the colony of Victoria. And it also talks about um, a kind of post gold rush era, but gold mining in South Africa. So there wasn't just one gold rush. Uh, there were a series of gold rushes from 1848 to, I would say, 1901. And Chinese miners played a role in all of them or in some of them? Yeah, they, went to, they went to pretty much all of them. You know, in Australia and California, Chinese were upwards of 25 percent in the mining population. Um, also large numbers in New Zealand. Um, and the South African case I have is, is a little bit of distinctive because it's a it's a short term um, indentured labor program. But 60,000 people went there from China um, in the first decade of the 20th century. All right. Um, our next question is, can you speak to the role of Chinese laborers and shopkeepers in the post bellum 19th century South? especially as it relates to connections with the newly freed African-Americans. I don't know a whole lot about Chinese merchants or shops in the South. Um, we do know from uh, Moon Ho Jung's book, Coolies and Cane, that Chinese that were brought um, to work on uh, sugar plantations in Louisiana um, uh, at, under contracts um, didn't like working on those plantations. Um, and a lot of them voted with their feet. They just left um, because they could not be held there by force. They weren't enslaved. They couldn't be held. So just like um, the former slaves, uh, many of them left plantations. Um, so did Chinese. And they went to the cities and some of them became a wage laborers. Some of them uh, became shopkeepers. Uh, but I actually, I'm sorry to say, I don't know about their relations with African-Americans. Thank you. Um, a somewhat related question um, that probably both of you might be able to answer. Um, were there any Chinese Americans who fought in the Civil War? And if so, for which side? There were, I think there were a few hundred and I believe they all fought, fought on the side of the Union. Do you know more about that, Eric? No, I don't. I realize that that's not, uh, presumably they were mostly enlisted on the West Coast uh, for in, in California. That's where the largest black, uh, Chinese population was. No, but they also, um, I, I've read about Chinese from Ohio who fought in the Civil War. So there were Chinese scattered around. Yeah, yeah, yeah there were. Uh, this is a good subject for a doctoral student somewhere. Yes, those paying attention from home, take note. Um, another one is more about the process of working on this book. We have a few questions in this vein. Um, did anything surprise you in the research for this book, 
and how, if at all, did the book change over the course of you writing it? Yes, uh, there were a lot of surprises in my research. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, that uh, racism against Chinese in Australia was not initially on the gold fields. Uh, it had nothing to do with charges of coolism or slavery. Um, so that was a surprise to me. And then I realized that, you know, well, why should it be? Is the different conditions there? And so um, knowing that politics are local, I, I really tried to think about that. That was a surprise. The other thing that was uh, a finding that was not so much a surprise, but actually very useful to me that I hadn't really known was how Chinese in these all these different places had very similar forms of labor and social organization. So one of the problems in research in California is that the archives are very uh, weak. Um, California had just become a state. There are very few official records. Uh, mining districts were very spread out and um, democratic, if you will. And so it's very hard to find claims registers, right? Because it goes by district. So there are maybe a handful that are extant in California where you can actually look at how people claim their, their gold claims. Um, so I looked at those and, um, and I, I could see how, how the Chinese played into that. But what really helped me was researching in Australia because in Australia, the colonial government kept excellent records. In fact, they were crazy about, they were very zealous about policing the gold fields. So they had all kinds of records. And there, the Chinese were in the, they were in the registers, the claims registers, they're in the tax rolls, they're, they're in everything. And you can see actually much more clearly the pattern of organization. So for example, if you see six Chinese with a claim and each one is written with one six, one six, one six, you know that's a cooperative, right? As opposed to another claim, by one person with a large area, well, he's probably hiring people to work on his claim. Not, it's not a cooperative. So in California, I saw traces of that, but not enough that I could really say that really what was going on. But when I compared it to the Australian case, I said, you know, it's the same thing going on. And then when I saw one tenth, one tenth, one tenth, one tenth in a California register, I said, okay, that's the same model of a cooperative. So that's just one example of how when you do comparative work, you can actually see something in one place and it can help you understand something in another place. And that happened to me a lot with, with a lot of different issues. So thanks and, for the question, that's a great question. Um, a follow-up to that that's a little more specific, but since you did spend time at the New York Public Library, um, somebody asks what archives at the library you used or looked at while working on your book? Um, I looked at a lot of maps. The map room was great. I looked at 19th century maps of California. Um, I spent some time doing that. I read a lot of um, accounts of the gold rush written not by Chinese, but by uh, Europeans or, or Americans. And those are actually very helpful. I mean, you may just have one or two places where they talk about Chinese, but you know, you learn from that, but you also learn a lot about the gold rush. So I've probably read as much about, you know, as many journal, more journals and diaries by non-Chinese about the experience of gold mining than of Chinese themselves. Um, but you learn a lot from that. And you can also learn about their relations, uh, race relations uh, from those accounts. Yes, and perhaps I should put in a plug for the library to remind everyone that the New York Public Library is fully reopened and accessible to the public should you wanna start digging around in maps and archives yourselves. Um, stepping back a little, somebody asks, can you discuss the origin and meaning of the word coolie? And in the US West, how common was it for Chinese to live and work underground? Okay, well, that's two questions. So right, they, um, coolie, it came as okay, one. Okay. So <laughs> coolie, um, there's a misunderstanding of the word. Um, in, in Chinese, people say coolie, which they think, which means a bitter kind of labor. Um, but that actually is not the origin of the word coolie. Coolie is um, it's a European invention. It's, it comes out of um, Asian port city pidgin language. And we think it actually originates in India, 
where coolie is a is a um, Hindi word um, for uh, a, somebody who just works uh, a wage earner, a wage worker, a lowly worker. And in the context of um, uh, pigeon language in port cities like Macau or um, uh, Canton, coolie came to mean just a lowly worker. So the Europeans are talking about my coolies, meaning, you know, the porters or the people who work as servants. It was just a general term for a lowly worker. But it became associated with indenture um, in part because the um, workers that were uh, hired on contracts to work on the former slave plantations in the Caribbean were called coolies. So then it became associated with indenture. But in the Asian context, coolie never meant indenture or slave, the slavery, but it became uh, British and the Americans gave that connotation, which, which stuck. So what was the other question about? Right, the um, unrelated section oh, part was- Working underground. Yeah. Um, uh, the Chinese who went to California mostly work in rivers, you know, in creeks and streams, um, panning for gold uh, in, in water. They also worked in um, hydraulic mining, which was uh, the use of huge um, uh, high pressure water hoses, which actually uh, took apart mountains, right? Uh, to release all the gravel with the gold in it. But Chinese also did work underground for wages. They worked side by side with American miners and Cornish miners as late as 1870. Uh, until until they were uh, pushed out. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the people who wrote about the Chinese in the deep mines in California said, you know, they're, he called them brawny pigtail workers. He said they were every bit as good as the Cornish and every bit as demanding that they, he said their wages actually were becoming very close together. Um, so the white miners pushed them out and it could not have been because they were really cheap labor because they actually had come to earn the same amount of money, but it was a part of, uh, I think, a landscape of um, job scarcity uh, that led to that. So they did work underground um, in, in California, although not, not in the main. Well, um, here is, I think, our last audience question. Um, do you feel the lack of detailed prior research was a form of inherent racism or simply lazy scholarship or more just denial? Well, as I said, um, the, the sources in California are, are very difficult. There are very few and far between. I spent years going through haystacks looking for the needles. Um, you know, uh, it, it's very difficult to, to research uh, Chinese in the California gold rush. Um, and I think that's one one reason why it hadn't been really taken up before. Even later when Chinese had come work on the railroad, there are also very few records. Um, and it's just in the last couple of years that there's been some books that have come out um, that have really taken a look at Chinese on the railroad. Um, so I think in because of that, we didn't have um, empirical uh, research to really understand what the Chinese were doing. And so what you had was this racist blather all over the the atmosphere of the, the, the racist position, which got plenty of air time or print time. Um, and so that became the kind of knowledge that existed in, in the historical literature. And some of it was actually, I think, very biased. You know, like the book that really promoted the idea that Chinese were coolies was written by Gunther Barth, who um, was a student of Oscar Handlin. And Oscar Handlin wrote in the introduction to Barth's book, this book proves my theory of immigrant assimilation. The Chinese are the exception that proved the rule. The Chinese were sojourners, they didn't settle, they didn't stay, and they didn't assimilate. And so that's why um, they, they were uh, vulnerable and that's why they didn't become Americans like the Europeans. So even in the historical profession, the Chinese 
were kind of used to prove a, another kind of theory, which I think is very interesting. And actually, I'll just end on this. Barth was not the first, he was the first to really push this, but before he wrote that in the six, 1960s. But if you look at things written by sociologists in the early 20th century, they didn't say Chinese were indentured. They actually had it more right because they didn't have an ax to grind. They didn't have, you know, a theory to prove. Um, and nobody was that old stuff. They, they were reading the stuff written in Hanlon school. So it was time to overturn it. So I think we're done. Are we done? It would appear to be. Uh... It would appear to be. That's the end of the questions. Right. Well, thank you, Eric. This was a stimulating conversation uh, as usual. Well, and congratulations. Thanks, Congratulations on this very fine book. I commend it to the people listening. It's also very well written and readable. And uh, as you have heard, it's full of all sorts of fascinating historical insights. So um, yes, thank you, May, and um, have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you.